I need how many machines? I hear this question often. Whenever somebody wants to build a new system and they get the bill, one of the first questions they ask is, well, why am I paying for so many machines? If you work in IT, then the answer is really obvious. But if you aren't, or if you're new to IT, then let me show you how we arrive at the number and, crucially, how that's going to be affected by the arrival of cloud computing. First, let's look at what a typical setup might be like. You need five or six machines in order to get one, which actually runs the software that you want to have running, the system that you have in mind. And these are development, a build machine, integration testing or SIT machine, user acceptance testing or UAT machine, a production machine, this is the machine you actually wanted in the first place, and finally, DR or disaster recovery. That's the full six. Let's look at each of these in turn. Firstly, development. This may often be the programmer's personal PC, but equally, if you're going to run the system itself on a different operating system than the programmer runs on their PC, you will need a separate machine. Second is the build environment. These days, systems development is a team sport. No one person will be able to write all of the code. So you need somewhere to put all of the little bits together and make sure that they all fit. You don't do any real testing for functionality on this environment. You literally just put all the bits together, run a compiler or an assembler, make sure that they all work together at a basic level. This is a kick the tires, see where the wheels fall off level of testing. Then we have integration testing or SIT for systems integration testing environment. This is the first time you do any real testing on functionality. You wire the software up to data sources and data destinations. Usually these are other people's SIT environments and represent the systems that your system is going to have to interact with when you put it live. Then you push some simulated data through. It's important, this shouldn't be real data. There are actually a whole load of legal ramifications around using fake data to do this. The idea here is that you're testing the data flows and transformations from a system to system level. Major logic flaws should become evident at this stage. I'm now drawing a line above these three environments. These are the only three that your IT staff should be allowed to log into. You'll often see them being run on completely separate network segments or completely different environments. Our next machine is UAT or user acceptance testing. Ideally, this should be as close in configuration, connections and data as it is possible to make it to the real production environment. This is where you do your main set of testing. At this point, major logic flaws should be gone. You should have tested the data flows and transforms. They should all be working. And you have real users, hence the name user acceptance testing, real users log in, not IT people, to do testing on the system. And finally, eventually, after three minutes and 20 something seconds, we get to the production environment. This is the machine you actually want. This is where the system that's going to be making you money will be running. But we're not done yet. There's a final environment, which is disaster recovery or DR. Computers, all computers, eventually fail. Or you may have an incident with your data center, which makes it unavailable. Think bomb, flood, fire, anything. It's literally the unknown. So what you will have is a spare machine running in a separate data center. This may or may not be kept running in the exact same state and with the exact same data in it as the production environment, dependent upon how susceptible you are to short-term loss of service. If it's a real-time trading system where milliseconds count, the two machines will be running in parallel. If it's a mailing list system where it being down for a couple of days won't matter, then typically they won't be up to the exact same level of readiness. So there you have it. In order to have one machine that's actually running the system you want, you end up having to buy five or six. And for very good reasons. It, nobody's being silly here. Every single one of those machines has a purpose. The big question now is, does this change with the cloud? And in short, the answer is a resounding absolute yes. Why would that be though? We've just proved that each of the machines has its own purpose. 
None of them are there as a wasted machine. They're all doing something. The big trick here is that with a normal data center, you will commission all six of those environments and leave them running all of the time. You literally have six machines there, ready and available for people to do work with all the time. You won't be using them for most of the time. They're only going to be used sporadically when you're doing that piece of work, but they're all sitting there. Now with cloud computing, you rent machines by the hour. You don't pay for them when you're not using them. You can have them turned off, the state of the machine is saved to a disk, and it's only bought up when you need to use it. So instead of needing one and paying for six, you need one and you pay for one. That's a huge difference. Now, in reality, it's a little bit more complicated than that. You don't actually end up only having one machine. You quite often keep your DR machine up and running as well. And usually somebody will be doing something with the system, either a developer or you'll be doing some systems changes. One or more of the other machines will be up. So you end up with a saving of maybe, maybe half. You have six machines, that's half to three you end up saving half your budget. That's a prize worth fighting for, particularly if you have a lot of machines. So that's why people are so excited about cloud computing. 